All right. So first, let me start with the introduction to quantum sets. So we've already had that a little bit in the previous uh, talk, but yes, but let me go over it again. So in the quantum case set problem, we have as input a uh, Hamiltonian H, which is the sum of uh, K local projectors and each H, and the total Hamiltonian is on N qubits. And the question is, uh, is the uh, minimum eigenvalue of H zero or is it bounded away from zero? And now the, in contrast, the K-local Hamiltonian problem is uh, defined in the same way, but uh, here we are only interested in either checking if lambda min is smaller than alpha or lambda min is uh, greater than beta. And so, yes, in comparison, k -sat has a stronger promise in the S case. So uh, we demand that it is in fact frustration free and the ground state energy is zero. So these are uh, complete for uh, QMA1 and QMA respectively. And so what do we know about this? Uh, for example, uh, two sat is MP by Bravi. And yeah, so same as classical. And the two local Hamiltonian is uh, QMA complete. The classical analog would be max two sat, which is MP complete. And uh, for three Q sat, we know it's QMA1 complete by uh, Gossett and Nagai. And uh, three sets is NP complete, of course. And now, what in this uh, talk we are also interested in a special version of quantum two set, which we call a quantum KL set. So here, each HI acts on a Q kit and a Q lid. So uh, if these dimensions are different, then we have a, a bipartite system. And what we know is that uh, three by five Q set is QMA one complete by L and Regal. And uh, two by three Q set is NP hard. And a two by three classical set would be NP complete also. And uh, we're also interested in uh, the setting where we just have a 1D line of qubits. So for this, we know that QMA, it, it, uh, it's QMA complete for D equals 11. And uh, we also know the classical 1D set is always in P. Uh, we now on a three by three line. There at least exists a uh, frustration-free Q-trit construction with a unique entangled uh, ground state. And so in this uh, paper, we mainly investigated the question, what is the smallest local dimension that can encode uh, QMA one hard problems still? And now let me go over our results. So first, uh, for the two set, what we have here is like a table of the different uh, KLQ set results, and in red is the ones that we proved. So the main parts are two by five Q set and three by four Q set. And the other is like to the bottom and to the right, you get for free. And yeah, so we have like these three, we only know NP hardness. And uh, yeah, so this one is uh, NP. The black ones were known before. And uh, we also have a special part for the soundness of the Hamiltonian problem. And what this means is that when we take our verifier and get verifier and the reduction, we embed it into a Hamiltonian H, such that the, the norm of Hamiltonian is bounded by the number of gates. And uh, in the no case, what we have is that we can lower bound uh, the eigenvalue by one of n squared, which matches uh, other um, circuit to Hamiltonian constructions. And uh, our techniques also work for the three Q set. And there, I mean, this was known, but we can improve the soundness there. And on the lines, so we have the first QMA1 hardness result for lines of alternating particles where the smaller dimension is three. So you can think of it like this, we have Q-trids, Q-dids, Q-trids, and so forth. And uh, what we show is that it's QMA1 complete for this number D. And uh, so the reason why it's so big is we have a black box simulation technique. We take any 1D uh, Hamiltonian on uh, Q-dits and we turn it into three by D prime set, but this increases us to the fourth power roughly. And uh, yeah, so, so the idea is that we're preserving uh, soundness in the null case, similar to this analog Hamiltonian simulation results, uh, Bravi Hastings, Hubert Montenegro, Pidog. And uh, the way this works is we take uh, the 1D QSAT problem uh, on 11 by 11 and we embed it into this to get the QMA hardness. And uh, so, so the last part here is how difficult is if we just have Q bits and Q dits on the line. And so here we show 
that we can, in fact, have a frustration-free 1D 2 by 4 Hamiltonian with a unique uh, ground state that's entangled across all possible cuts. There, yeah, so we have uh, qubits and uh, q for its here. And now let me go over the sort of 2D Hamiltonian construction that we use for this uh, QMA completeness results. Uh, first, to recap uh, Kitao's basic circuit Hamiltonian embedding. So the goal is to construct a Hamiltonian whose uh, ground state is the history state, which uh, roughly looks like this. So you have some input state psi, and then you have some uh, logical time steps, which you call CT here. And uh, so we have a superposition over all the, all the time steps applying the gates from one by one. And yeah, so these time steps are imposed by some Hamiltonian, which we call H clock. So this just forces this uh, space to be in the clock space. And in the following, we just could uh, set our projectors to be in the clock space uh, for simplicity. And yeah, so then we have transition terms, which is uh, basically just from T to T plus one, you apply U, from T plus one to T, you apply your dagger, and these terms are just to make it a projector. And yeah, so what goes in guy show is that uh, you can, in fact, embed a circuit into a Hamiltonian by just having so-called uh, selection projectors, which look like this. So we just select all time steps greater than uh, t, or smaller than t, and uh, transitions from one local gates. And so the general idea is that you use two dimensions. So we have like two clock registers now, and uh, so, so we can just put the H clock on the uh, two registers. doesn't increase locality at all. And so in this work, what we do is like we construct a two by five local H clock and also the uh, one local transitions. And uh, what we can do with this one local uh, projectors for these terms here. And so let me go over the gadgets that were used by Gosset and Nagai. So, so these are the main building blocks from which you build a 2D Hamiltonian. So the first one is sort of an exclusion gadget. Uh, if we select here on X, all time steps greater or equal three. On Y, all time steps less than or equal three. Then we exclude this quadrant. So like we have our grid of time steps here and we say we don't want any support on these time steps in this quadrant here. Then here we have a transition gadget. So this uh, takes us on, on the Y axis from uh, two to three and applies some unitary here. And the little arrows indicate that uh, this gadget is applied to the whole row of our uh, grid. And so we can also just apply it to one part of the row. So then we can select here all times is greater or equal three, but then we only have enough uh, locality left to build a one local transition here, an identity transition. And lastly, we can do a conditional transition. So here we have a, a conditional qubit, and uh, then we can also do a, a transition that only fires on the cat one state in the control. And so the naive idea to construct this, so this was not, this is just like an intuition how to do it, uh, is to start on the top left with a uh, input on the top uh, bottom right is your output, and then you have the cat zero, your, here, and then you apply your x, your y along that path, and the one you send across the other path, and then you apply your y and your x. So in total, this would apply this gate v here from top left to bottom right. And for suitable non-commuting your x and your y, uh, you can realize this not gate up to one local unit. That was shown by Gosset and Nagai. And uh, so, so the reason why this super simple idea does not yet work, why it needs the more complex construction is, that uh, we have these spatial restrictions on the gadgets. So like uh, one local transition always is across the whole row or the whole column. And then so instead of this, we in practice could only get something like this. Now we have something that looks like a, a commutative diagram, but uh, we explicitly chose UX and UI to not commute. And so, so this uh, would uh, be frustrated system. So it doesn't work. So we need a little bit more complex construction. And I, so yeah, so this is how our construction looks like. It's very similar to GN13, but it's slightly modified for our proof techniques. And yeah, so uh, won't go that much into detail, but it's just that uh, on CAT0, we make these uh, transitions solid. On CAT1, we make the others solid here. And then you get the path like this. So first X and then Y, and for one, you get first Y and then X. And uh, the center here is also penalized because we have these uh, is a contradiction here. So x, y should be y, x, but these are not commuting. So that the center is penalized. And uh, yeah, so correctness of this construction follows via uh, so-called unitary labeled graphs. And uh, yeah, so compared to GN13, well, that was just proven with uh, numeric analysis. 
And so we can put these gadgets together by putting them onto the diagonal. And so this is super simple, just a one locking gadget. We take uh, just the one locking gate from the top to the bottom. And we connect these with the squiggly edges. And yeah, so the zigzag edges uh, connect all the gadgets. And then we have a so-called nice face connection lemma, which we use to uh, prove correctness in the gap. And yeah, so the way this lemma works is we have uh, given a circuit Hamiltonian on uh, some graph of clock states, where uh, the H1 part, uh, or the gate gadgets, we have uh, M different circuit Hamiltonians on clock states uh, Ki, so it's like a subset. These are disjoint subsets of the clock space, and each implements a single unitary gate from the input node Ui to the output node Vi. And so we can have an example in Kitao's Hamiltonian. We just have to add identities in between, but then this is, is just one U1 and then V1, U2, V2, and so forth. And it's super easy to analyze just the action of a single edge because these are just spanned by states that look like this. So it's just a history state of two time steps. And so we also have the condition, uh, the, the connection edges. So, yeah. And then what we can show is that the combining these embeds the full uh, socket from the first input node to the last output node. And uh, we achieve, uh, the, we can sort of preserve the gap up to like a M squared here. And uh, gamma of H is the smallest non-zero eigenvalue. So yeah, so this is another way to prove guitar symmetry, but it works very generally. And now let me go over our two by five clock. So uh, there, the main question is how can we even use a qubit to do something useful? Because yeah, I mean, yeah, so just a single qubit, then even flipping it, uh, you will usually select more uh, time steps than you want. So the idea here is that, um, yeah, we need a two by five clock uh, with one local transitions and uh, selection projectors. And so the idea is then to use logical qubits, and these are implemented with indicator qubits so that we can select a logical qubit based on a qubit. So for example, if you want a logical qubit, you can build it with a q 6 it and three qubits, and then it looks like this. So here we have the indicator qubit, and now that we need to use an additional dimension for each indicator qubit, because uh, if we want a one logical transition between say one hat and two hat, then uh, we don't, we can just do it from here to here uh, because here we have a, a different uh, uh, qubit and we wouldn't select that if we build a transition just between these. And uh, to enforce the superposition structure, we can use two by six projectors in this example. And so, but okay, so this was for qubit was already too much. So how do we actually do it with two by five only? And so here we recall Elder Regev's result from uh, the, QMA1 completeness of three by five set. And uh, so, so the idea there is you get uh, three active states, basically. So if five it has U, A1, A2, A3, and D, these are the active states. And uh, actually two active states uh, suffice for, if we use a 2D Hamiltonian, so then we get a three by four set. And now all that remains is to transform the three by four set into a two by five set. And so for this, we have the logical qubit, which we built on a five bit and two qubits. So we have here two indicator qubits. And I, I won't go too much into detail here. It's, it's really like a very technical construction. And it's not super nice intuition for why this has to be precisely how it is. And I mean, I don't exactly know whether it can be, can be improved or not. So yeah, just take it for granted how I write this here. And we also have uh, the for it. Here we only have space for one single indicator qubit. And um, so what can we do now with a one local qubit projector is we can identify the U, D, U, or A. So, so the big U, we can just identify here. The small D, we can identify here. But if we select this indicator qubit here, we get uh, both of these, actually. So uh, then we have to use more tricks so that we don't uh, select too many states later. And yeah, we can also do a transition from U to A by just flipping a qubit. Uh, but then we have to make sure that we don't uh, act on the D. And now, how do we combine these clock states? So, uh, yeah, so we have our clock states, C1, 2, Cn, and this look like that. So you basically have a lot of dead states, and you have single alive state, and then you have unborn states. And, uh, yeah, so each clock 
state is a superposition of these four terms here. And uh, this can be enforced with uh, two by five projectors. And uh, the nice thing here is now we get like this A1 to A2 here between these two. So we can have uh, one local transition between two clock states on a five bit in this here. Uh, yeah, so then let me uh, sketch how the 1D, 3 comma D set works. So the idea is we have, uh, we want to do a black box simulation. So we have our Jude Hamiltonian here on the line. And now we have an H prime and we get a much bigger D primates here, but in the middle we just get two trits. And then sort of the information of this Q did will be represented by half of this Q D prime it, by this Q trit and the left half of this Q D prime it. So this, uh, these are mapped. And uh, then we have that, um, these are actually equal up to a local isometry. And okay, so, so more formally what we do is, okay, so we have the symmetry here, which is given on the line. And uh, we say each HI is uh, positive semi-definite. Then we can efficiently compute some H prime on a three comma D prime line, such that uh, lambda min of H is zero, if and only if lambda min of H prime is zero, and uh, the gap is also preserved. And so this is, uh, yeah, again, how this looks like. So uh, the idea is to logically split the QD prime its into two QD prime prime its. And D prime prime then, of course, has to be the square root of D prime. And yeah, so then each D prime prime times three times D prime prime system logically represents a QD. And yeah, so, so then we sort of have to move the logical QD between these QD prime prime its. And for this, we use this H ball, which we call this like this because uh, we use like a balls and bins model to, to uh, implement this gadget. And uh, then because we, the information is available one locally, we, it, it actually suffices to build our gadgets just with one local. So here we can just place a one H one two up to a, a local isometry. And then, yeah, so, so because this, D prime prime it and this D prime prime it both have the full Q did information available. And so, yeah, so the basic idea is, was um, with the balls and bins that, uh, yeah, so we have bins and two different colors of balls here, red and black. And uh, the D prime prime it has a capacity of two D balls. So in this example, we have uh, D equals two. And so we have four different balls. And here we have two red balls and two black balls. And so a logical state is then represented by two times I minus one uh, red balls. So in this case, we have two. So we have two uh, red balls and two black balls and then one additional black ball. And uh, yeah, so uh, then our H ball Hamiltonian enforces a superposition of all different placements of the ball. So they sort of move around and this is how we shift the information between the QD prime prime. And yeah, so the reason why we need an extra ball is so that we don't have the two adjacent bins empty configuration, because if this projector here has to allow uh, two empty bins and this projector has to allow two empty bins and the all empty configuration would be allowed, which uh, we don't want. And yeah, so to act on the logical configuration, we detect if the bin is full and it has an even number of red balls. And then we know it's sort of, then we can read out the extra configuration. So this one, we don't act on this. So here we can see it's a uh, logical two. And yeah, so the balls and in superposition can be moved around and yeah, so all different configurations of these uh, are in superposition. And now let me conclude. So well, the main open question is still the complexity of two by three QSAT and there were also two more open, uh, part, open entries in the table. So 2,4 and 3,3. And then what is the hardness of 1D QSAT uh, with D smaller than 11? So here our black box approach was a little bit of a problem because it leads to a huge second dimension. And uh, yeah, so then also the question, what about 2 comma D QSAT? Does the two here, is it still QMA1 hard? And uh, so 2 comma 3 QSAT instances, uh, can we even achieve fully entangled ground space? It seems like a very simple question, but I haven't been able to solve that even. And uh, yes, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So, any questions?
Uh, so you use the direct embedding in 2D case, but you don't use a direct embedding in 1D case. So do you think direct approach also works for 1D case as well? Yeah, what do you mean by direct approach? Uh, direct embedding so for 2D case also. Go. Oh, I mean, yeah, so for 1D, we use direct embedding for 2D. Uh, so I mean, you, the, in principle, you can do it, but I mean, here it was very costly. Like you, you blew out the second dimension. So in that case, I don't... So, so in that case, I think uh, having like you really tailor made a construction to be as efficient as possible is, is important. Uh, any questions? Okay, so if not, so let's thank the speaker again.